power and glory to reign. Coming with all the heavenly hosts, what a glorious time that will be. See the signs fulfilled one by one. Study His word, be watchful and wait. He is coming soon like a thief in the night. Jesus is coming. Good afternoon, friends. We are here again at the Spanish Town Seventh-day Adventist Church Bible class. We welcome you back for all those who are in the house and for those who are our faithful online um, students and um, head boys and head girls, the very regular ones. We remember Brother Jones and Sister Pam Roy and Sister um, Mycola. Mycola Sulet Burnett. Mm -hmm. Welcome back. And for those who are new, welcome. Where have you been? Wonderful things are happening. Information, information, information. And so we have enough to make our minds clear on the Word of God. With me, or together we are here, Brother Finsdale Lightbody and myself, Barrington Walters. Um, the other team members who have been here from time to time, Brother Oliver, Brother Linton, and so forth. They are preparing to come back at some point future. And so here we are again to do our section of the marathon. That's right. Preparing ourselves and you for the great coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and we know that we have to have information in fact that's what the Bible is all about information to equip us for knowing what to expect and so prepare ourselves for our Lord's return we pray that as we go through these studies, we will all take these things into account and we will study to show ourselves approved. Last week we were looking into the Bible, well, not so much only the Bible, but sacred texts. And we were looking at some of the general um, tenets that apply to them. For example, do they apply to our culture? How do they relate to the culture? How do they relate to spiritual things? Um, um, variation in print, or, or not so much the print, but the, um, the version of the scriptures and where they are, the, they, they are coming from, what source they were um, drawn from and so how well can we trust that word today we are here looking at give me the bible because we believe that of all books printed this bible that we carry that speaks to god as our creator God as our Redeemer, the one who sees the future and tells us in advance so we can prepare ourselves. This is the only one of its kind. And so, friends, we must pay heed or take heed to the Word of God. This is going to be an interesting in-depth study as we go along, and we want to welcome you to... Bible class. Thank you, Elder Barry. And I must add that as we reflect on last week, we identified the various sacred writings mm -hmm. of major world religions. Right. So we looked at the Christian, yes. we looked at Hinduism, Islam, that's right, Hinduism, Buddhism, Buddhism, Judaism, mm -hmm. and so on. And what we found out is that every single one of these groups have 
a document mm -hmm. that they regard as sacred. sacred. It's the word of God, whoever they conceive God to be. Mm -hmm. We also recognize that the God who they acknowledge as their God has given them this body of information mm -hmm. to guide them. In addition to that particular document, there are other authoritative writings that help to explain the main source of um, spiritual guidance. It's common to all the religions. Yes. With the exception of Buddhism and Hinduism that do not have a central, a particular, a, right, a particular a central document mm -hmm. that they can look and say, oh, yes. Just like how the Christian looks at the Bible, mm -hmm. Muslim looks at the Quran, mm -hmm. and Judaism look at the Tanakh. They have other documents that, they are, that are used to guide. So what we're going to be doing today is looking at the one that we as Christians mm -hmm. embrace and say, this is our sacred document mm -hmm. and the reason why. So before we go into the study, I'm going to ask that you bow your heads with us as we pray. Mm -hmm. We thank you, dear Father, that you have not left us to wander about mm -hmm. seeking the truth and not being able to find it among the myriad uh, documents and purported authoritative writings. You are very plain with your word, and you have asked us to trust your word. Mm -hmm. And we know, Father, that throughout history, those who have trusted your word were successful, although they were persecuted for doing so. And those who did not trust your word got into serious trouble. And so in order to avoid the pitfalls of the past, we're asking that you'll strengthen us and give us the courage to believe what you say and no other in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we saw in the beginning of human history, Elder, our parents were spoken to directly by God. Yes. And he says, of all the trees, let, let me back up. Um, he said a lot of things to them, be fruitful and multiply. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things he said were not documented. Just the salient ones. But we can be assured. We can be assured that, that you whatever have, he told them were right. good things in, to in perpetuate a, life and well-being, spiritual well-being. That's right. Because when he says that they must um, have dominion on the, over the earth and subdue it, mm -hmm. we are sure that the Lord would have given them some lessons in agronomy. Mm-hmm in aquaculture mm -hmm. and whatever field of science you can think of mm -hmm. the lord would have given them particular instructions regarding so it's like they went to school and they were learning stuff and they're putting it into practice but the one that obtains that we are looking at directly now is the one that says do not eat of this particular tree for the day in which you eat of it you shall surely die that is the word of the Lord. And then we find someone else comes along and says, Did God say? And that's all we're studying this quarter. So when we say we're looking at the word of God as the, the overarching theme. But, but for us as Christians, we are saying, Give me the Bible which is a document containing the word of God. In essence, friends, God says one thing, mm -hmm. and someone else comes along and says, did God say? That's the in essential question. And even when we study the Bible, we find that people have varied interpretations oh, yes. of it and causes confusion and the bible itself says god is not the author of confusion so why do we as christians ignore the other religions and what their sacred writings say 
and embrace this document called the Bible. It is very simple. It's very simple. All the writings within the various religious groups um, convey an image of the God that they worship. And many times the God that they worship is a wrathful deity. He's a God that is um, judgmental. And you can't sleep with him. Because the moment you sleep, there's going to be punishment. And therefore, you'll, you find yourself always having to do something to do what? To appease, to appease this God. So, the adherents or the followers of this God live in fear of punishment when you do something wrong. In addition to that, Elder, we find that the, the God is transcendent. He lives outside the space, the realms of um, humanity, human existence. of human existence. And that also increases the fear and also the mystery surrounding this God. But when we turn to the Bible, we find something else, Elder. Mm -hmm. What do we find about this God? This God went to the ultimate to correct the controversy going on by becoming one of us. So we, we start by saying the Bible paints a vivid picture mm -hmm. that our God is a God of love. love. Mm -hmm. So that when mankind did step outside mm -hmm. of his instruction, rather than blotting them from existence, as you said, he stepped right mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. human mm -hmm. existence. existence and experience. Mm -hmm. And he called himself Emmanuel, which means God, God with, us. with us. And in this book, he says, I will be with you always, even unto the end. So what we find, friends, is that the God did not, although he's transcendent and will always be transcendent, that means he lives outside his creation. He controls his creation. Mm -hmm. He's not part of the creation like what pantheism mm -hmm. teach no, or pan panentheism that he's in the creation itself. He steps into the creation, but he remains God. Mm -hmm. But he also identifies with his creatures by becoming one of us. Through Christ through Christ. And the reason for doing that is to help us to understand his character. That he's not a wrathful deity, that is a judgment. Unforgiving. Unforgiving, but he's a God of love. But it's not the love that covers over wrong and pampers people and say, hush, never mind. It's a God that says, I want you to understand that if you continue on this path, you are going to destruction. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to help you to stay on the path of righteousness. Mm -hmm. This is what this Bible tells us about our God. That's why we are Christians and that's why we love him. And so any incorrect notion about the judgmental God, the Bible itself tells us that it's a misapplication of scripture and the scriptures are there to tell us exactly what God's character is. That's why we, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, embrace this book as the word of God. Welcome to the students who, are, who have signed in pretty early. They're all there. We're glad to have you all. I see um, the head boy, uh, head girl. Um, we have prefects as well, you know. Oh, and student counselors, they're all there, act very active. And the teacher's assistants, welcome. So. We are going to reiterate the fundamental belief of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which is fundamental belief number one. And it says, the Holy Scriptures, Old and New Testaments, are the written word of God 
given by divine inspiration through holy men of God who spoke and wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. In this word, God has committed to man the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are the infallible revelation of His will. They are the standard of character, the test of experience, the authoritative revealer of doctrines, the trustworthy record of God's acts in history. And if you should read the preamble to many of these other religious groups, Elder, they would say something similar about their document, about the Quran, about the Tanakh, about the Bhagavad Gita and the others. And I want to say something here as we're on this page about inspiration. What we discover is that all the sacred writings claim that the author received divine inspiration from their God. And let me tell you, friends, you cannot deny that. We cannot say because they are not Christian, they did not receive inspiration. But from which source? That's the question. Because in the same way that God inspires the other one who demands allegiance, who wants to be like the Most High, he can also inspire. And when we did the study last year on the spirit of prophecy, we discover, and I, I will share this in the class just to remind you, when Satan, let me back up, when Moses went up into the mountains to receive instruction regarding the tabernacle, the earthly tabernacle, the Lord said to Moses, do it according to the pattern showed you in the mount. In the mount. And very often when we think of what Moses saw on the mountain, we are thinking only that Moses saw a blueprint. And everybody knows what a blueprint is, right? Hello? Yes. Class members, you know what a blueprint is? It's a design of how a building should look. Mm -hmm. Where the columns should go, where the windows should go, where the doors should go, where the um, electrical um, outlets, outlets and so, and so on, where the plumbing is to go, what the roof must look like, etc. It's done on a flat or on flat sheet of paper. Mm -hmm. And it's because they're printed in blue ink, why people call it blue. blueprint. Right? But the, original, the origin is actually black. So we think that that's all Moses saw. But using my sanctified imagination, and um, especially since um, Orson um, studied architecture, we recognize that when an architect is, is given a job to design a building, he, he not only draws the two-dimensional, the blueprint, the, two, the image in two dimensions, he also has to construct a model. So, for example, if he was designing Spanish Town Church, he would make a small, what they call a scale model, mm. of what the church looked like. Have you ever gone into business places, banks and so on, and you see a small um, um, model mm -hmm. of the building? You see it on a table, mm -hmm. and it looked like the big building that was, that's exactly what we're talking about. But they have gone further, Elder. The architect not only designs and makes the model of the building, now they, are, they do, um, they use graphic mm -hmm. software 3D. to do it in 3D. Mm -hmm. So they create a video presentation. Mm -hmm. So when they're showing it to you, Sister Roden, the video presentation have you actually walking, walking through, through, it, through the through building it. to see what mm -hmm. inside look like. Mm -hmm. So when you go to the business place and you see the model, you have to lift off the, the, the roof mm -hmm. to look down to inside. See the to see the partition. In the, three, in the video presentation, there is a computer graphics to design it so that mm -hmm. you can actually walk through the building and see what it looks like. 
and it also rotates the building so you can see what it looks like on the west side, the south, the east, etc. So using my sanctified imagination, I believe that the Lord not only gave Moses the, the, the flat, the blueprint, mm -hmm. he gave him a video presentation in panoramic view mm -hmm. so that he could see exactly what inside the sanctuary looks like. Are you with me? So when Moses stood up and was supervising the building, he could say, no, that's not how it is. Mm -hmm. Because he, Moses, had seen the exactly video presentation mm -hmm. so that he had an accurate representation of what God gave him. Are you with me, class? Good. So, Jesus is now in the, in the wilderness praying at the start of his ministry. Satan comes along, the Bible tells us. And in one of his temptations, he, he takes him to the top of the mountain. And the Bible says he did what? Showed him the kingdoms, of, kingdoms this of this world. Now, question. Did Satan take Jesus on a flight to London, to Hamburg, to Tokyo, to Brisbane, to Kingston? <laughs> he said he took him on a mountain. So how did he show him the kingdoms of this world? He must have shown him a video presentation. Yes, because they were on the mountain and the kingdoms passed by, just like you're watching, and now they have drones, el Elder, yes. that can go above and look and show you what it looks like from above and at street level. So Satan actually had Jesus looking on these video presentations of these cities, like you're watching a documentary mm -hmm. of some of these great cities. So what I'm saying, friends, is that Satan, as a spirit being, a fallen angel, mm -hmm. has the power to do that. Mm -hmm. So these people who claim inspiration, we must not say it is not so, because they will tell you they saw it. This is what they saw. Because the fallen angels have the power to give you these visions. Mm -hmm. Hello? And to, and to plant thoughts in your minds. If I may interject yes, here. Yes, Elder. That the spirit of prophecy tells us that the powers of these angels were not abrogated save that they cannot produce life. So what, however God made them, they still have the power to do things. That's right. To appear, to disappear, to come like your grand aunt and whoever you knew. And that's why people will say, um, you can't convince them. Because them sure is them grandmother mm -hmm. them see. Mm -hmm. But we have to be careful because their powers were not abrogated mm -hmm. save that they cannot make life. That's right. So he'll do anything to deceive. And that is why, friends, we are studying this topic because the only thing that will save us from deception is the word of God. All right. So no book has been so loved. When I read this, I, 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 um, I have to say, but you do not hear of any other book being treated the way that the Bible has been treated. No. <laughs> you can't you can't treat the Quran anyhow, you, you know. You can't treat the Quran. They, they, they're coming for you. Yes, um it just was it last week we were talking about Salman Rushdie. Mm -hmm. The man who <laughs> is an is a British author. He wrote a book called The Satanic Verses, referring to the Quran, that's a Muslim holy book. And the great Ayatollah Khomeini, who caused the world to tremble, he issued a jihad. Mm -hmm. A jihad means holy war. That means anywhere this, this man was like a fugitive, as they say in police, in the police setting that shot to be shot on sight. They don't want him dead or alive, bringing the body. So that is what was out for Rushdie. And he had to go in hiding. Mm -hmm. And after he hid himself for some time, he um, resurfaced some years later and claimed that he was now converted to Islam. And that is why he's still alive. But if he had remained like that, he would 
be a dead man. But the Bible has been so loved, so hated, so revered, and so damned. People have died for the Bible. Let me pause. I remember um, Pastor Glenn O. Samuels um, referencing an interaction he had with a Muslim when he was over, somewhere overseas. I don't remember if it was the United Kingdom or United States. And he said he gave this guy a tract or some pamphlet, and the guy threw it down. So he followed after him and he said, you know, why did you do that? What if you had given me a copy of the Koran and I did that to it? And the man looked at him and said, I would slit your throat. I would slit your throat just like that. So that is how seriously they take the Koran. So without even thinking or blinking, they would do that. Yet, the Bible has been treated worse than the Koran. Others have killed for it. It has inspired man's greatest, noblest acts and, and blamed for his most damnable and degenerate. Wars have raged over the Bible, and we're going to mention that in a future study. Revolutions have been nurtured in its pages, and kingdoms crumbled through its ideas. That's how powerful this book is. It's loved, it's hated, and it has caused destruction. People of all viewpoints, from liberation theologians to capitalists, from fascists to Marxists, from dictators to liberators, from pacifists to militarists, search its pages for words with which to justify their deeds. And none of these persons who have been mentioned in this, um, what I just read, is anything good said about them. Revolutionists have looked for things in the Bible to justify their revolution. Oh, yes. Slavery has been justified by scriptures. So let's go on. We're going to look now at some facts relating mm -hmm. to the Bible. The Bible is the best-selling book of all time, with an estimated six billion copies sold and distributed. About 100 million are printed each year. Sales estimates for other printed religious texts include at least 800 million copies for the Quran and 190 million copies for the Book of Mormon. Also, a single publisher has produced more than 140 million copies of the Bhagavad Gita. That that's is the, the Hindu that's right, book. That's right. But of all the religious books, the Bible supersedes in terms of the numbers Number of printed books. each year and the numbers that since the inception of Bibles, the numbers that have been um, printed and distributed. Mm -hmm. So best-selling individual books. So we're looking at the list now of the best-selling books. The Bible, six billion. The Quran, three billion. The Little Red Book, that is quotations from Chairman Mao Those in you, Vietnam. In actually, he is the one who started the communist revolution in mm. China. Mao Zedong. How oh, many mm, of you yes. remember that name? Mao Zedong. He also called Chairman Mao. Mm -hmm. He died around 1976, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. right. 900 million. Don Quixote. 500 million. Selected articles of Chairman Mao, 450 million. A Tale of Two Cities, that is Charles Dickens, 200 million. The Lord of the Rings, famous movie now made, 150 million. Scouting for Boys, an instruction in good citizenship, 150 million. The Book of Mormon, 150 million. The Little Prince, 140 million. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, 120 million. So there it is, friends. These are the best selling individual books. And once again, the, Bi the Bible tops them mm -hmm. all. 
So let's look now, zero in on mm -hmm. more facts on the Bible. The Bible. This sacred text brought Christianity to the world and has continued to serve as a source of inspiration for millions of people. It is the most translated and the most frequently purchased book in the world. Uh, can we pause there, Elder, before we go for I don't want to go deeper and, and we forget this. Earlier we talked about the fact that people use the Bible to justify their dastardly deeds. We were talking before the stream started how some people, if their neighbor um, irritates them, they go for the Bible to read them as Psalms. Not true? Okay. Yes. yes. Um, there are persons who are involved in, I, I understand people who are involved in necromancy and the Obiaman, they involve the Bible too. Mm -hmm. Not true? Mm hmm. Um, there is this little trick thing that they used about the Bible and key, which is a, another satanic prank where you want to find something that you lose and you put the key in the Bible and so on and it, whatever happens. Or you can find out who is the person that took this thing or that thing and so the Bible and key is used. Yes. And you call the names and whoever, whoever his name it drop off. Mm -hmm. and, yes. And, uh, boy, <laughs> trust me. There are some people who go to their beds afraid, mm -hmm. and what do they do? They open, open the Bible. The Bible. To the Psalms. Yes. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, even criminals, mm -hmm. after police have um, put out their light, among the things, you know, the police uh, report always says, um, the person, the, this man or men, were seen acting suspiciously. Mm -hmm. And when the police approached, the men opened fire at the police. The police or took, ran. The police took evasive fire. action mm -hmm. and returned the fire. Mm -hmm. And after they have a, um, extensive search, a, they one found, man was found uh, suffering, suffering from, from gunshot, gunshot wounds. wounds. He was pronounced so dead, dead on, arrival on, on, at on hospital. the spot or at the hospital. Or, mm -hmm. And a, a Glock Among the things taken yet, from him was a, was a Glock pistol with well. so many spent shells and mm -hmm. so many live rounds. Mm -hmm. But they never tell you that they find a New Testament, a copy of the New Testament oh, in yes. their back pocket. Mm -hmm. Because even the criminals know that the gun mm -hmm. alone cannot protect them. Mm -hmm. Right? So they carry around the New Testament just mm -hmm. um, as a means of additional protection. protection. And when we think about these things, it is so amusing what people use the Bible for. And of course, we don't want to go in the blasphemous acts of some of these people who would tear up the Bible. There's a, there's a very sad um, episode that I'll just share with you. And if my siblings are watching, they will remember the story. When I was in all age school, one of my classmates... Um, he attended the church with his uncle and his cousins. That's a Seventh-day Adventist church. His mother and his grandmother, with whom he lived, um, they attended the Baptist church, which was in another district. So when we got to age 10, 11, you know, the elders start to look in your direction. What are the elders thinking about when you reach age 10 or 11? It's time for... Baptism. Right. So, when it was my turn, February 1973, it was just my turn. My friend was approached by one of the elders to say, it is time. And that was the last day the young man came to church. He didn't come back with his cousins. Stop coming. We both passed common entrance. Well, I was a year ahead of him. And we went to the same high school. It got to the place in the mid-70s. Those of us who remember, it was a time when the question of Rastafarianism in school was a big, big thing. There were even demonstrations on campuses in Kingston and my school in Montego Bay. Whether 
students with locks should be allowed on campus. And my classmates joined that group of Rastafari Rastafarians. And the, everything, and those of you who remember, it was a time when Bob Marley was big, 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 big. Peter Tosh, Bunny Whaler, Chant Dung Babylon, among other things. Big, big thing. So, a lot of young men drifted into Rastafarianism. Simple for, for this reason, and I, I don't think it's religious. It, um, for the most part, it was rebellion. Rebellion against the established order. Mm -hmm. And they want to smoke the weed and do whatever. And one of the songs was um, Light Up the Spliff in Buckingham Palace. Mm -hmm. But remember now, the leader of the, the quote-unquote leader of the Rastafarianism is the one that says he feel like bombing a church. Mm -hmm. All right? Mm -hmm. So, long and, short of the show, long and short of the story is, when he reached fifth form, he had become really radical. And so he started to be a menace to his grandmother and his, his mother. And he did a lot of things which irritated them. And among the things he did was to take the Bible and burn it and say he was burning God out of his yard. That's what he said. You're talking about a 17, 18 year old young man now. On one occasion, he and some friends of his who were cousins of mine through another line, decided to run a boat. But these guys, these other guys, they didn't go to church. They decided to run a boat. And those in the house know what run a boat means, to cook food. And in the food that they were cooking, they had cassava. And those of us who are smart enough know that any, any water that cassava cook in, you get rid of that water. He and his friends drank the water. The other two guys got sick. And my friend, my classmate, died. It was judgment. You cannot... The Lord winked at ignorance of those other two young men. But this one who knew better, who grew up in the church, you, you, you blaspheme God by burning the Bible, he crossed a line and he perished for it. So it's a very serious thing to go against the word of God. Now, we continue looking at the Bible, Elder. The, 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 that has brought Christianity into the world. And the, the information you're about to share that when I interrupted you was that this book is the most translated and the most frequently purchased book in the world. Can you imagine? And by the way, please remember, we are English speakers, but when we speak of the Bible, we're not speaking of the Bible only in English, but in all the languages of the world. As Elder shared with you last week, um, what, what did you say about the, the little New Testament, the Gideon's Bible? You shared something with them. It's printed in, it's done in many languages. So when you go to, I think it's the front page, it has the most popular mm -hmm. scripture, which is what? John, John 3.16. 3, and it is there in, I think, about 22 languages. Mm -hmm. So when, we, when we're talking about the Bible here, friends, it's not just the Bible in English. It's in every language. Mm -hmm. All right? Good. Next fact, Elder. So, unsurprisingly, he says, the Bible is not only the world's most widely sold, but most translated in the world. Individual parts, that is, you may be the Old Testament mm -hmm. or the New mm -hmm. or sections of, have been translated into 3,394 languages and the complete Bible into 694 languages. Mm -hmm. While the Old Testament was translated from the Aramaic and Hebrew languages, the New Testament was translated from Greek. The Bible, in its most different versions, is said to have been printed 
2.5 billion times. Mm -hmm. What is interesting is that the word Bible is most likely derived from the old Phoenician or now Lebanese port city of Byblos. Byblos. Okay, Byblos, mm -hmm. which was a large trading center for papyrus plants. You know, the papyrus plant was grown in Egypt and along the Nile, and they used it, they beat it out, mm -hmm. and somehow, I don't know what they, the process, mm -hmm. but they rolled it out, and it became almost like paper to be written on, parchment. Right, what they did, um, you remember, they talk about the bulrushes, mm -hmm. where Moses um, was, was placed, right, so it's this plant, the same plant, that was there. So what they would do, they would dry them first. So get rid of the, the chlorophyll and all of that. Then when it was dry, they would soak it in water. And they would press it until it gets flat. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, it's the same process that is used to make paper. Mm -hmm. Today, where the, the bark yeah, of the tree pull, pull pulp and then... The and then it, it they spread it out and, and, and put a weight on it until it gets flat so that you are able to put information on it. So that's what they did. Continue, Elder. Ancient. So in Old Greek, the word Biblos mm -hmm. was used to refer to the papyrus plant, but also to paper or a piece of writing. Or a piece of writing. Or a piece of writing, right. The plural Biblia meaning pieces of writing became Bible. All right, so Biblos refers to the, not only to the plant, but also the, the paper mm -hmm. or, or a piece of writing, mm -hmm. also to paper or a piece of writing. And it is singular. The plural is Biblia, mm -hmm. which means pieces of writing. And when all of these pieces of writing were put together, we get the term Bible. So, we have a graphic on the screen which you are going to see in a little while. And it talks about the most, the top 10 most read books in the world. Um, guess which book is at the top? Guess which book? It should be hard to guess. Which one? All right. It's the Bible. It's the Bible. Mm -hmm. You're oh, there's the graphic. You can see the graphic now. All right. That one in black? That one in that's black? That's the Bible. That's the Bible. So it stands head yeah, and shoulders good. above mm -hmm. every other book that has ever been read. And you know... Um, it is, it is a fact that in um, prisons, the, the inmates that have access to and read the Bible are the easiest ones for the, the, um, of the officers to control because the Bible takes away that animal-like nature that got, got, got them into crime in the first place. So when we look at the, the books here, we see that um, the next red book is uh, quotations, quotations from, from Chairman, Chairman Mao, Mao and <clears throat> Harry Potter, mm -hmm. followed by the Lord of the Rings, then the Alchemist, then the Da Vinci Code, you know what is an interesting, Elder, as we're looking at these things? These other books that have been mentioned here are really books that deal with Satanism, mm -hmm. having something mm -hmm. to do with the satanic yes. thing. All of these other the books. The occult and the, the occult, arts, that's right. All of these things. That's right. Gone with the wind. Think and grow, grow rich. The diary of Anne Frank. I want to say something about Harry Potter. Not Harry Potter itself, but an experience I had. Ah, the year, I can't remember the year now, um, but this was 
This was over 20 years ago. My friend, Brother James Lee, who was the, one of the junior Sabbath school teachers, he was one of the, the, the male teachers, aside from um, Brother Morris, Eddie Morris. So he said, I want you to come and talk to the children one Sabbath about things pertaining to the occult, you know. So, because he said the challenge he's having is that many of them are not studying their Sabbath school lesson. And there were things, this was before the age of um, social media. So, when I got there, the first question I asked the students, so we're talking about um, 12, 13, 14 year olds. I said, um, raise your hands, those of you who have watched, who have read the Harry Potter books or watched the movies. Out of the group of children coming from Seventh day Adventist home, only about three hands did not go up. And yet, um, Sister Janine used to teach around there during those occasions. She used to teach the younger children. And one of the things, and she, will, she would have said this to you. Yeah, I think she had talked. She would say to you that, and these children, when they come to Sabbath school, they do not know their Sabbath school lesson. They don't even know the memory verse. It's like they, when they come to Sabbath school, they have to be taught. Yet our children were reading the Harry Potter books and not the Bible. Is it any wonder our generation of young people is as it is today? But I tell you, if you look at the, the, the caliber of the children, um, I don't know, it, it would be fair to mention some of them who were faithful ones who didn't who were not involved in these readings, if you look at their lives today, you'll recognize that they had good upbringing. They did not bow. The, the two Corrodas children. Mm -hmm. might, not, might, might not get people jealous, Ella. And, and Kamari Jones. <laughs> might not get people jealous. She spoke highly of those three. Mm -hmm. Look at their lives today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are others who we will, will not name. Let mm -hmm. some, some of our friends online get jealous. Yes. But you know the young people that you have seen around the church, and you mm -hmm. see the, the quality of service that they have given to the church, having grown into young adulthood. Mm -hmm. Those who watched who, and who read the Harry Potter books read themselves out of church. It came to a place where they no longer had any interest in church, which is what Satan intended anyway. Mm -hmm. Right? And there are some persons who are justifying the Harry Potter by saying um, at least the children, they had no interest in reading earlier, now they are reading. Mm -hmm. But what are they reading? Mm -hmm. What are they reading? I see your hand and I'm going to ask the um, technical team members to provide a microphone for the members in the house. Alright? So as soon as the microphone comes, we'll take your your all right as brother carrington arrived you do not allow him to sit you just send him on a mission mm -hmm. oh, that's all right that's all right microphone is coming mm -hmm. but while it's coming let's look at some more facts about mm -hmm. the bible the holy bible holds the title for the most read book in the world according to the guinness world records research conducted by the british and foreign bible society in 20 21 suggests that the total number probably lies between five and seven billion copies it sells over 100 million bibles in a year so the bible society conducted their research well the sorry guinness book of world records um, rec um indicated that this the british and foreign bible society did the research and found that this is what is happening. People are reading the Bible more than any other book, confirming what the graphic had shown us. Yes? Yes, teacher. I just want to make a point here. Um, when I listen nowadays, even in the 
normal world here that we go around the marketplace and so on. I listen to the conversation of the young people of the day, men and women, and then uh, there's a talk on the phone. The phone is mastering a big part of society, and they would, if they would confront you with some negative argument and prove it to you on their phones. And the phones are watering down the Bible too and saying some negative things and they prove it on the phone. Mm -hmm. What they are saying about the Bible that is wrong, they prove it on the phone. So I'm saying, the hard point also is that the phone is having negative uh, effect on the society in a whole, I mean, especially the youth. How about our youth? What do you think about our youth who come to church? Do you think it will have negative effect on them too? Well, the Adventist youth? Well, to answer your question directly, I remember when this section over here used to be filled with young people mm -hmm. and there was a time when we stood up here in the pulpit and we used to have to beg them to um, get off the phone, um, turn off the phone so that they can be a part of the service. Mm -hmm. Those youth are no longer in church. What happens is that God gave the technology to be used to communicate the gospel, right? But Satan has corrupted the technology and they are using it for wrong purpose. And it has, as you just observed, they have been led out of the church, led away from Jesus through it. But let's remember, it's the same means that the Lord uses to bring some members into a relationship with him. So it can be used for good and bad. Right. I was just about to say, well, yeah. not so much the technology is corrupted, but the people themselves have allowed present world views to corrupt their minds and their understanding of life to the degree that they will misapply themselves. And so what is intended for good is used for evil the man who invented gunpowder had invented it to he saw where a certain good could be uh, uh, could be used could be accomplished by using it but as time went on he began to regret because he realized that people were now using it as explosives to hurt other people in wartime. That's right. The gun went through the same process. It was for hunting. And so it would make capturing um, large, large prey mm -hmm. easy. But the mind of man, as, as um, Genesis chapter 6 tells us, that um, man was continually thinking evil. So God had to wipe them out at the flood. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is happening today. There are many ways that we can utilize technology and everything else around us. But there are those who are corrupt in mind who use it to do evil. That's right. Uh, right now, I, I have this device here. I, I use it, you know, to monitor the, 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 the online class and this device has my Bible, my hymnal, my quarterly and the spirit of prophecy writings. Mm -hmm. So anything I want I just go into the device. So God has given the device to help us so when you're going along you can just take it out and you can read something. If you didn't get to go thoroughly through your lesson because you're rushing while you're riding, um, not driving, notice I said not driving, while you're riding, you can take it out and go through your lesson and read the commentaries and so on. You can do your research on this device. Mm -hmm. And God has designed it, as Elder said, for a good purpose, but Satan has corrupted it. Right. And matter of fact, we're going to see further down that the Bible not only exists 
in terms of Biblos paper, but we also have the electronic Bible mm -hmm. because God's word must reach everyone everywhere through every means. Now, the first book that was printed on the printing press. So the Bible is a, is a book of first in mm -hmm. everything. It is called the Gutenberg, or the Germans, they don't pronounce the G. Gutenberg Bible. The, the person um, who did this, his name is Johannes Gutenberg, who completed it around 1455 while he was working at mines in Germany. So, the printing press. So remember now, before that, everything was done by writing. Or they used to carve it on wood blocks or, or clay tablets, and then they would print it on the paper. So now, the original, wherever you go and you say print you where they print documents, the original printer is this man, Johannes Gutenberg. And they talk about movable type. So now you have the letters, all the letters of the alphabet. You have several of them because you're, you're writing a word that, has, that uses up more than one letter. So you have to have several of them. Mm -hmm. So you have them. Those of you remember the old time typewriter with the, with, the, with the letters on the key? And when you touch the key, it strikes the thing. Right, so that is a form of the Gutenberg press. In, in the early days of, yeah. of the printing press, mm -hmm. they had little cubes, a little flat um, cube, like it's, well, it's square, mm -hmm. and it's about um, a half inch, maybe, thick. And on these were embossed letters. So they are raised on it. Just like the now, stamp. Right. When they so, stamp a document, right. What you had to do when you have information to give to the public in document form, paper printed, you had to set up overnight mm -hmm. to do what they call typesetting. Setting. Because you have to put those little blocks to form the words in order and to form the sentences and phrases in order so that when you went to the press, which was a big turning wheel, which you spun it around to press down. So when it's inked and placed on a board, which they slip it in, and so it, it is held in a groove. So when you press that down onto the paper, it prints whatever was there, typesetted. And the interesting thing about the typesetting, you, you have to know what you're doing. Oh, yes. You better um, spell on. <laughs> do you know that the letters were set in reverse? Yes. Backwards? Mm -hmm. Yes. Because remember, you're going to print it mm -hmm. so you can read left, to, left right. to right. So when you set the type set, the, the T was turned backwards, the H, etc. Mm -hmm. It was lined up backwards so that when it prints, it comes out forward. If you remember the, the, the typewriting key, if you, if you could look on the letter, you would see that it was set backward. Mm -hmm. So that when you hit on the thing, it came out um, going the, in the right direction. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, teacher. Um, the, I want you to this text, this reading. Um, I read in the Daniel Revelation, it, it says, my two witnesses were slain in a certain part of, uh, in, in Revelation, uh -huh. book of Revelation. Yes. My two witnesses were slain, and everybody remained and buried on the earth for three days and a, and a half. Mm -hmm. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And the uh, ear of God says, come up either. And they were exalted up to heaven and gave glory. Now, in the Daniel Revelation gave me a, a little uh, explanation mm -hmm. that the Bible was burnt by France, and after... 260 years, uh, the release that the government of the day give order to print back the Bible by King James, and that every uh, that a copy 
should be placed in every church and that men should come back to worship at the son of Abel. So I don't All right. Um, you, you gave two, two accounts of history that are miles apart. But I'll, I'll... So this, and this sets us up, Elder Barry, because we, we had promised that we're going to do a series yes, that on, sounds on like prophecy. Yes, we need to do something on we're, that. We're going to... Mm -hmm. We could only focus on major prophecies of the Bible last year, but mm -hmm. we're, going to, we're working on a series where we're going to cover other prophecies in the Bible. Minor prophets of es the Bible. Especially in the book of Revelation where those other chapters that you're speaking about there. Mm -hmm. So the French Revolution was in, 70, in, this, in 1790s. Right? Right? The, the King James goes all the way back to 1606. Mm -hmm. Right? When Guy Fawkes tried to blow up the parliament with him. So we're talking about... Um, um, oh, nearly 200 years separating mm. the two events. Mm -hmm. All right, but we're going to speak to uh, the King James experience later on in the study because it's important because what his role in history has to do with the Word of God. All right, but the, in the French Revolution, the Church of Rome was despised because of how. She treated people. She lived in luxury while people lived in poverty. And she was very oppressive because she controlled all the nations of the world. Well, of Europe at the time. And so, they, during the Napoleonic War, they threw off the yoke of the church. So, you know, the saying about throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. So, they threw out the church, and with the church went the Bible. And so, atheism was born in France. So, when the Pope was overthrown by Berthier in 1798. Atheism came into America. So the Bible was despised. It was burnt and all of that. But it said it, the two witnesses, their bodies would, be, would land in the street for three and a half years um, and, no, and um, they wouldn't be buried. And then, after a while, life would be given to them and they'd be taken up. After the, the French Revolution and they brought in this woman who was nothing more than a common prostitute, they brought her into the French Parliament and said, she is the goddess of reason. It's from this profligate woman that this Statue of Liberty was designed and sent to America as a gift by the French. But that's another story. What followed was something unimaginable in human history. The slaughter of innocent people. That was when this machine called the guillotine, sometimes we say guillotine, that is when it was invented. So in your office you use this machine to cut paper. It was not originally designed to cut paper. It was designed to cut off people's head. So they would be, their heads would be stuck through these vertical posts. Mm -hmm. And the blade would be up here. And the blade was um, a diagonal shape. And it would, they would just pull the rope and it would just come down, a heavy blade. And shook, and your head would be gone. That is how, um, um, what was her name? Louis and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette. That is how they were gotten rid of. Louis XVI. And many persons were mm -hmm. blooded during that time. They lost their lives. And when the people saw the horror following what they did, they said, no, we need to bring back the Bible. So the two witnesses being caught up, in the early 1800s, Bible societies mushroomed out of nowhere. That's what this prophecy was talking about. So earlier we talked about the Bible Society, the British Bible Society, the American Bible Society, French, all over the place. Bible societies were born, and the Bible went everywhere. I tell you this, Voltaire said, um, this book of the mm -hmm. Bible will be uh, extinct within he, he a took certain 12, he amount said he took of 12, years. 12, 12 men. And, and here is it. The very place he was born and lived yeah. is the very place that the first Bible house stood. 
in France. <laughs> he said something else. It took 12 men mm -hmm. to establish the Christian church. I am going to show that it, it will take one man to bring it down. Mm -hmm. That was himself. Of course, he died and the church is still here. Mm -hmm. Amen? Because of the word of God. Mm -hmm. All right. So we establish... Uh, before I move on from the Gutenberg quote, it is interesting that during this time, 1455, mm -hmm. we were in the middle mm -hmm. of, well, not quite the middle. Quite the middle. We were approaching a crescendo mm -hmm. in the Reformation because Wycliffe was a little earlier, well, somewhere around that time. He was, he, was before, he was before um, Luther, yes. about 100 years before Luther. So he was called the morning star of the Reformation. So now, um, reformers were writing, mm -hmm. or should I say, translating the Bible, mm -hmm. because the Bibles available to them were in Latin. And what's interesting also is that in around 1453, when Constantinople fell. So Constantinople was the headquarters of the eastern half of the Roman Empire. A lot of the Greek scholars or theologians in Constantinople rushed back to Europe so that, because the Muslims had come now and said, we are taking over and Islam start to spread. So they rushed with their manuscripts and everything pertaining to Christianity, came back to Europe around 1453 mm -hmm. and at this time now the, be, the people no longer had only the Latin manuscripts they now had the Greek manuscripts of the Bible mm -hmm. so they were now translating the Bible using these mm -hmm. main sources and now Bibles were to be printed mm -hmm. so what did the Lord do? <laughs> he brought into existence the printing, printing press, press. Because this is what needed to go. My Lord is so good. And notice that it was in Germany that this happened. And it was the place where Martin Luther was. That's right. And beginning what, the Reformation. That's right. So, so here again we see another Pentecost. Mm -hmm. Because on the day of Pentecost, the believers needed to hear the gospel. What was the problem? Those who knew the gospel only spoke one language mm -hmm. which the people did not understand. So what did the Lord do? He provided the gift whereby the gospel would be propagated. Mm -hmm. So in the 1450s, at the height of the Reformation, when the people needed to hear the wonderful works of God, what did the Lord do? Provide the means whereby this must happen. Isn't the Lord wonderful? Mm -hmm. All right. So, here's another interesting fact about the Bible. <laughs> Apparently, thieves missed the thou shalt not steal part of the Ten Commandments. Because according to experts, the book most commonly stolen is... I thought you would say it out loud. <laughs> the the Bible. Bible. Of all books, the one that tells you not to steal is the one that they are stealing. Right. I'm going to ask um, a member of the team to stand by with a microphone for Elder Barry's mic. It, yes, it's sometimes it acting up. Right. Um, many times, and, and I see you, you there laughing about the stealing, but the stealing of the Bible. But if we can remember, friends, over the years when we listen to um, mission stories, we hear on many occasions where this person was in prison for stealing a Bible. And the very Bible that he stole converted him. So the Lord allowed the Bible, his, his book, to be stolen because he knew it's the means by which persons would be converted. All right? So here's another fact about the Bible, Elder. The text was written over the course of 1,500 years. While there is some debate, most biblical scholars agree that it took about 1,500 years to write the Bible. 
While Genesis is the first book of the Bible, many experts believe that the book of Job was written first. The last book that was written and added to the Bible was the book of Revelation. It is estimated to have been written around 96 AD. All right, while Elder is having his microphone checked, um, the 1500 years, we wonder what's the starting point? The Exodus, that is God's people leaving Egypt under the leadership of Moses and his lieutenant uh, Joshua, occurred around 1450 BC. So 1000. 450 years before Christ came on the scene, the people of God left Egypt. Now, what did the Lord do to the leader or with the leader of the, East, the people of Israel at that time? He gave him instructions regarding his word. So Moses started to receive inspiration from God shortly after the exodus around 1450 and we remember when he went up into the mountain to receive the ten commandments right it was right in that period so um 1450 and we say it's around 1500 years so if we move forward we're moving to the time of christ and his disciples so we move from bc to a.d and who wrote the last book of the Bible? Who wrote the last book of the Bible? John. We call him John the Revelator. And this was around 96 AD when he wrote the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible. So Moses was the first writer and John the last. An interesting fact though mm -hmm. is that many of the children of Israel were not really learned in writing mm -hmm. that's right but look at how god worked it out a certain baby was placed in a tarred basket set out on a river and the people who controlled things who had knowledge found the baby trained that baby, well, he grew up with his mother for a while because they smartly um, brought in, and uh, um, kudos to Miriam. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. She was smart and quick thinking, you know. And, and, I, and this is a note to our parents. Train your girls. They are not less than boys. Train your girls. They have a brain and they sometimes work out smarter. She ran and said, you want a nurse to help you? And who is she going to call? The mother. So he got his early training and establishment in what was truth. Mm -hmm. But later on, he got the training from the elite of Egypt. So who better to write out, <laughs> have the knowledge and the ability to write out what God instructs him to. So God provides every time, every time. Absolutely. God provides the means. He equips the called. And called the equipped. And what he does, he anticipates every move. So, as you mentioned about uh, the baby, he knew that he had a plan for this baby. Mm hmm he also had a plan for the written word. Mm -hmm. So he was preparing Moses long before. Oh for the, and, and what is so interesting, Elder, we're talking about the, the papyrus. It's right there on the Nile, right among the paper mm -hmm. that he was going to write on. And in the country where they developed the technology, because mm -hmm. Egypt at the time was the United States of the world, the great mm -hmm. superpower. Yes. Right? So the Lord prepared him. For this uh, great task and uh, um, there was a thought that came into my mind but I'll rest it for yes teacher time. just want to strengthen what you are saying here we are we are talking about this this miracle mm. that the, 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 the judge 
Speak into the microphone. The killer, mm. as the, 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 the baby in his hand, who was to, to be the master for God in future, and couldn't kill him. Aha. Thank you. Aha. Mm. Couldn't kill him. Right. Um, in fact, he was used to train the very one who was to deliver them. Ab absolutely. Uh, there is, a, there is a, a, um, an individual that I listen to regularly, and I mentioned, I mentioned his name on this platform quite a number of times. It's Walter Veith. You, some people say Veith, V-E-I-T-H. Yeah, but he's but German. So he's he German. He pronounced Veith. Right. And he was talking about his learning because he was a professor of physiology. So he trained doctors. And he, he was discussing his training in the schools of the world and, and um, comparing it with what the church offers. And the, in fact, not, not, not the church, the Bible offers. And he said he had his PhD in error. Mm. Can you imagine? His PhD was in error, in foolishness. It's when you come to the church that you get the right education. Mm -hmm. Because true knowledge and true wisdom comes from, a, from God, comes from above. All right? We're going to talk a little bit more on the facts of the Bibles. All right? And you're going to discover something about the Bible that you didn't know. About, about Bible that you didn't know. And so the the no number of books yeah. in the Bible varies. While all Bibles have 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament, there are additional books that are accepted in different branches of Christendom. And if I may interject here, I remember as a child, my father had an old lady to relate to in, um, old, in, in cross keys. And when she died, some of the things she had were taken up to our home in Blenheim Town. A gramophone, one of the shorter ones, and a big, big Bible. It was called the, um, the, the, what's the name, what's the name? Mm. It was the Bible, the Apocrypha. The, the, no. The, the, no, man. I soon tell you. The Protestant Bible has 66 books. The Catholic Bible has 73 books. The Orthodox Church does not have a universally approved biblical canon. Orthodox Bibles can have between, it's the Maccabee Bible. Oh, yeah, I don't know the memory would come back. Now, the Maccabees were a Jewish sect who were part of the revolting against Rome. Right. So, so they wrote in that 400 years between Malachi and Matthew. That's right. That's right. They operated in that time. And so they wrote, but these books were not recorded in the canon of the scriptures because it's it said they were not um, spiritually uh, inspired. Right. The term they, they used. They were more it, historical. Right. The term they used was apocrypha, mm -hmm. which means of doubted origin or inspiration. So the Protestants did not have these books in their Bible, but the Catholics have these books. And when we were growing up, Elder, in the 70s, there was a, a song that we used to hear, Bring Back the Maccabee Version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because they said that's, that's the Bible that God gave to black man. And black man must get up, stand up on foot, and give God the glory. Right? It's that same thing. And you have first and second Maccabee, you have Judith, you have Tobit, you have Esdras, quite a number of names. Yes. But they were not deemed to be inspired as the other mm -hmm. 66 books by yes. Protestants. Mm -hmm. The Catholics still use those. And that is why some of their teachings are strange to our ears. Mm -hmm. Because they regard these as um, just as important as when you're reading from first or second kings or any of the other books. 
The simple explanation for this is that Martin Luther, who started the Lutheran Church, which served as the foundation for Protestantism, removed seven books from the Bible. This includes several books from the highly debated Apocrypha, which means of doubted authority. Right. The Bible is over 1,000 chapters long. Additionally, the Bible has an astounding 1,189 chapters with 929 in the Old Testament and 260 in the New Testament. Of these chapters, both the longest and shortest chapters are in Psalms. Psalms 117 comes in as the shortest Bible chapter, while Psalm 119 is the longest. Mm -hmm. You will notice that at each beginning of the Psalm 119, there is a three-letter um, um, syllable there. It's the alphabet of the, um, the, Arama was it Aramaic or Greek? Aramaic. Or, or uh -huh. Hebrew. But it was part of the, the alphabet. The alphabet, used. okay, for uh, mm -hmm. Hebrew, mm -hmm. to be Hebrew. Right. Yeah. So the Bible in its entirety has been translated into 704 languages and at least some portion has been translated into over 3,000 languages. Additionally, there are numerous versions of the Bible. With so many versions and translations, things were bound to get lost in translation at some point. Now in a later presentation, we're going to look at Bible presentation, um, sorry, Bible versions. All right? Now, the Bible was written in three languages across three continents. While the Bible has about 40 authors who wrote different sections, it was also authored on three continents. Mm -hmm. So the Bible was written in Asia, Europe, and Africa, and in three different languages, which are Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew, while the New Testament was written in Greek, the language of scholarship at the time. Aramaic was the common international language of the time and most likely the language that Jesus spoke in real life. So the Galileans spoke in Aramaic. Now when they're writing the letters to the churches, which is what the New Testament books are, because the churches were scattered all over the place, they wrote in Greek. And the Greek they use is what is called Koine Greek, the, language, the Greek of the common people, not the classical Greek. Um, those uh, persons who have lived in the United Kingdom, you have one type of English they call the Queen's English. Mm -hmm. And there's another type of English that you know, the common people use. The Cockney. So... Um, they ensured that the language used in translation was actually the, la the language of the common people. That's what Tyndale and company endeavored to do. Right, Sister P? <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. And for those online who are wondering who I acknowledge as Sister P, Sister Pearl Henry, she is still here worshiping with us as our... Uh, one of our musicians, back in the day, she was in charge of the choir. So she's still here with us. Right, Brother Glenn and Brother Jones? Yes, that's Sister P. All right. Now, the Bible, as we said before, was written over the course of 1,500 years, mm -hmm. beginning around 1,400 B.C., by more than 40 individuals. And this is interesting, Elder. Mm -hmm. It's the only one of the sacred documents that has different authors yes. and written over such a so long, long period, period of time. Some who never met the other authors Never. At all. Most of them never met the other. And yet all the writings of scripture correlate. Mm -hmm. they, um, they agree. They verify. Mm -hmm. They establish. And so it tells you line upon line, text upon text, because it all threads together. 
wherever they were, whatever they wrote, it's all one thread. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so everything connects together and there is no discrepancy except as we do not understand mm -hmm. the culture in which it was written and the language in which it was written. So friends, uh, when you look at um, the Quran, for example, it was just one man, mm -hmm. just Muhammad. And you, you go around and you look one person. Even the Jews who use the Tanakh, the writings of Moses, mm -hmm. one man. But when you look on the whole Bible, you are asking yourself, how come there is this um, unity that is in the Bible itself when it was written by so many different people from so many different continents and backgrounds? Because the background from which these men came elder, um, prophets, fishermen, kings, philosophers, sc um, scholars, and poets. Uh, they didn't put the farmer in here. Mm -hmm. Because many of them came from, the, some of them who were prophets were um, yes. common people's children. That's right. But God, Nothing special about them. Right. Mm -hmm. Because look at um, Samuel. Mm -hmm. Who were his parents? Two ordinary Israelites. That's right. You see? So, uh, they, these people lived in 10 different countries on these, the continents we mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And each of them writing in one of three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek. Mm -hmm. And they wrote about God and his interaction. And God's interaction was with somebody counted, counted it in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. How God interacted with 2,930 different persons. So these, pers these people who wrote the Bible, they recorded how God interacted with 2,930 different characters from more than 1,550 different places. So the place names and the characters mentioned in the Bible are these numbers that God interacted with. And yet the message is the same. Mm -hmm. One homogenous thought from beginning to Absolutely. end. Absolutely. That is why it must be the word of God. So there's a question there that you need to answer, Elder, about the gap between the Old and New Testament mm -hmm. writing. There was a gap between the Old and New Testament writing. The writing of God's words took time, and there was quite a large gap between the writing of the Old and the New Testaments. In fact, it was about 400 years before the New Testament writings took place after the completion of the Old Testament. These years are known as the silent years. The Bible has 17 prophetic books. Here are the 17 prophetic books of the Bible. Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Lamentations of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. These books were all written by the minor prophets of the Bible. So we have the, the, the three major prophets, mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And, and, uh, that's right. As, as a matter of fact, four. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, yes. four major mm -hmm. prophets. And the others are minor prophets with major messages. Mm -hmm. Their messages, they're not called minor prophets because their messages are inferior. Mm -hmm. Because as we studied in our various um, Sabbath school lessons, we discovered that they had some major messages to give to God's people mm -hmm. throughout time. So we're looking at how the Bible is divided, which is mm -hmm. very unique. You have a prophetic section. What other section do we have? Oh, before we go to that, let's look at something else that the Bible offers. The Bible has over 6,000 prophecies. There are more than 3,000 prophecies, prophecy verses in the Bible that already come through in some way. Around 3,000 more prophecies are yet to come to completion. Right, friends. So here's the thing now, Elder. The other books of the Bible, 
I'm sorry, the other sacred writings do not have this content called prophecy. And this is what makes the book so unusual and so, uh, what's the word? I, I, it's unique. And this tells you of the divine origin. Mm -hmm. Because in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 46, where the Lord identified himself as the one who tells things from before they happen. Mm -hmm. He said, that's why you know that I am God. So it's recorded in his word. And Jesus in the New Testament says, I tell you these things before they come to pass, so that when they do come to pass, you will believe. No other sacred writings has so much prophecy as does the Bible. So that's what makes it unique and also indicates its divine origin. All right, so we look at prophecy. We're looking at, poet at poetry. Before you, read, before you read them, mm -hmm. um, members of the congregation, can you tell us the books of poetry in the Bible? Books. Songs of Solomon. Proverbs. Proverbs. There. Psalms. Psalms, Proverbs, what else? What else? Song of Solomon, you said. Two more. Huh? What was that? Oh, uh, no. That, that related to no. prophecy because it's mm -hmm. Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Right. No, that's prophecy. Mm -hmm. We're looking now strictly at the books that are poetic. Ecclesiastes, yes. Song of Solomon, and one more that Proverbs, carries the name of a man. Psalms, yes, and one more. Which book come before the Psalms? You don't know the Bible. You don't know the Bible. Which which one did you say? Job. Job right. right. Job contains poetry, and especially when you get to. Um, chapter uh, 37 thereabout of Job which is when God came down not to ask Job some question mm -hmm. and when God started to ask Job the question Job had to say okay Lord <laughs> I can't take any more God. God said yes you, you talk, talk like you're a big man stand up like a big man and take argument and start to ask him some questions so yes Job mm -hmm. alright yes so these five books Historians see them as links between his, the historical past and the prophetic books of the future. That's right. And Elder, we just a few weeks ago completed this study on the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that struck me about the Psalms is that in the Psalms is so much history and prophecy. Did you pick that up? A lot of history and prophecy are in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. So they are not just um, some, some words that we jump to when we need mm -hmm. to put no. people in their place or, um, and, you know, we, we don't cuss them out, but we just read them as Psalms. Mm -hmm. right? And many of them speak to the life and teachings and death and whatever sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus. That's right. In, as a matter of fact, we remember that Jesus quoted from Psalm 22, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And another thing about the Psalms is how much they are big on God. Mm -hmm. His character is painted so vividly in the Psalms. So sometimes we take a Psalm and we want to read it because we want something bad to happen to people who do us wrong. And we realize that but when the Psalmist gets to the end of the Psalm, he's exalting God. Mm -hmm. But when we're using the psalm to curse out people, we forget that that part is in there. <laughs> right? Okay, let's proceed, Elder. The Bible has four Gospels. What are the Gospels? So we look at prophecy, we look at poetry. What are the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes. Moreover, the term Gos comes from the old English word for God, meaning good and spell, which means news, in Christianity, the word good news refers to Jesus, his birth, death, 
sacrifice, and resurrection as part of saving his beloved people. And we should include here his current intercession mm -hmm. and, his, and his soon return. Uh, that's the good news. All right? Then the Bible has 21 epistles. The book, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd and 3rd John, and Jude. These books are all attributed to the Apostle Paul, although some dispute whether he wrote all 13. I, I was, the thought that I was trying to remember earlier, it has just come now. You mentioned before that when God needed someone to transcribe his word for posterity, he chose Moses. But Moses, uh, Moses was already being prepared from the time he spent in Pharaoh's court. Mm -hmm. But the Lord made sure he got a solid foundation on truth and who he is so that he could distinguish truth from error. So Moses in, in his adult years got his PhD in error. And the Lord took him and 40 years he removed the error from him, clearing his mind, tending sheep, so his mind could be clear to write the word. When we get to the New Testament, who wrote most of the books in the New Testament? Who? Paul. The, the mm -hmm. Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. Similarly, mm -hmm. Paul went to school and got his PhD in error. That is why he said, I don't remember if it's um, first or second Thessalonians, where he said, I count all things but dung for the glory, so, of, for the glory of God or so that I, can win, I may win mm -hmm. Christ. So he regarded his PhD as nothing mm -hmm. when he compared it with the word of God mm -hmm. because from it eternal life um, can be gained or it leads you to eternal life. So in the same way that the Lord prepared Moses mm -hmm. for the Old Testament, mm -hmm. He preserved Paul mm -hmm. for the New Testament. He got his training, mm -hmm. but at that time, the Lord needed somebody, mm -hmm. a scribe, who was going to put all the teachings of Jesus into a code written down so that believers can understand it. And, Paul, and with, and with mother, modern day thinking. That's, that is correct. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't think, um, you're going to have a challenge going through the epistles of Paul. That's right. So you have to have your mind tuned to the Spirit. Indeed. Because he tells us in one section where they were questioning his authority. Mm -hmm. So he had to let them know he was a Pharisee of all Pharisee, trained in the highest schools. That's right. You know. But all of that didn't matter. Mm -mm. All right. We have another collection of books in the Bible. By the way, the, bi the, the word Bible also means collection of books mm -hmm. or a library. You're walking around with a library. Can you imagine? You're walking around with a library, a collection of books. Mm -hmm. Right. The Bible has 17 historical books. I wonder if anybody in the congregation can guess what some of these historical books are. You may not know all of them, but you can share some of them. So none of the books that we have mentioned mm -hmm. before comes into this category. Mm -hmm. So yes. begin at the beginning. Genesis. Genesis. One. Good. Uh -huh. Good. Keep going. Keep going. Deuteronomy. Uh -huh. Joshua. Judges. Ruth. The right. Right.
right. No, the technical okay. team was helping you out by putting the thing on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I know you weren't cheating. <laughs> you're, you're, right. no, nobody was cheating. All right, but these are the historical books. Mm -hmm. So when you hear history, you, go, you know you go back to Genesis, which is a book of beginnings. And it comes forward and it stops just before the Psalms, just before the books of poetry. Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, so those are the main divisions of the Bible. Books of prophecy, history, um, poetry, and history. All right? Okay, now, <clears throat> the Geneva Bible was the first to be printed on a printing press. Um, we did allude to the Gutenberg Bible, which was in Germany, which was our own which was in 1455. Um, so about 100 years later, let me see if I can, what happens here with this slide, you are seeing it on the screen, is that by now, a complete Bible was put together. So what Gutenberg printed was not, um, when like after Tyndale and the others got together and put the collection of the Bible together in terms of the um, translating from the Greek and Latin and so forth. This was a process. It was an ongoing process. And so by 1557, the Bible of the Protestants was printed in Geneva, Switzerland in 1557, the Geneva Bible. It was the first version of the Bible to be translated from both Hebrew and Greek. Right? First version printed from both Hebrew and Greek. And part of the reason for this is that the Protestants recognized that the Latin version was reflecting more or less Catholic thought. So whereas Gutenberg had printed one, it, in, it, in, uh, it, uh, it involved Latin thought, la Latin thinking. But over 1557, Luther had come on the scene, Tyndale had come on the scene, and they had done their version of the Bible. So this one now was the main one printed for Protestants from Hebrew and Greek. Now, during this time, Queen Mary of England what was she also called, Elder? Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. A lot of people do not know that the Tower of London was not just a historical landmark that's, that was put there to make London look nice and pretty and historic. The Tower of London was actually a, a jail a, or a prison. For nobility. And the purpose of that prison was it was like a holding area mm -hmm. until these people were taken out and burned at the fires of Smithfield. All or, of this was done. Or du beheaded. Or, or they lost their heads. Mm -hmm. This was done during the time of Queen Mary. Um, it's called the Tower of London. It's on Tower Bridge in that vicinity. All right? So some of the persons I, we had mentioned then when we did the study last year on the spirit of prophecy, no, not, the, not that one, on his, um, sorry, great prophecies of the Bible. The Archbishop of Canterbury, who is the religious head of the Church of England, his name was Thomas Cranmer, and he had two friends, they were called the Oxford Martyrs, Hugh Latimer and um, Ridley, that was... I don't remember his first Francis, name now. Francis Ridley. No, I, I don't remember his first name. Ridley. So we always talk about Ridley, Latimer, and uh, what was the other name I called a while ago? Cranmer. Right. Those were three brilliant minds who were keeping the people of England focused on the word of God, following it as light as from the throne of God. And this lady who succeeded, I um, forget the king's name, but it, um, so after Henry VIII died, 
He had a son who took over. The son didn't last long. She took over and persecuted the Protestants and was taking the church now back under the rule of Rome. So um, she had them burned at the stake. And many of the Protestants ran away from England and went to Switzerland. And there Calvin, John Calvin, um, he was instrumental in the Geneva Bible being printed. And the Puritans who left um, Liverpool to go to the New World, the pilgrims, they took this Bible with them on the, on the Mayflower. Flower. That's right. The 1560 version, which you saw on the screen earlier, was called the Textus Receptus Bible. The reason for that is that they relied on the re received text, that's what Textus Receptus means, which came from Hebrew, which is what the Old Testament was written, and Greek, which is what the New Testament was written, not Latin. So they call it the Textus Receptus. All right? There's this other funny Bible, Elder. Tell the, the folks about it. Satan will try to corrupt things. And unfortunately, there is in history what is called a rare sinner's Bible with a typographical error. And this famous Bible states, or the Bible famously states, thou shalt not commit adultery. However, an ill-fated typo in 1631 said just the opposite. Thou, thou shalt, shalt commit, commit adultery. adultery. It was referred to as the sinner's Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Surprisingly, this rare Bible has only a handful of remaining copies floating around <laughs> due to this unbiblical commandment. It is said, so, Elder, that the, 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 the leader of the church uh, um, at the time, when this was done in, the six, in 1631, actually fined the, the printer mm. for making this error. He had to pay for his sins <laughs> of creating the sinner, sinner's Bible. All right? And I must say, this is how seriously those persons took the Bible because they want to ensure that, that God's word was, our, God's words were um, transferred accurately to the body of believers. All right. So there is other one now, Elder. Things get from bad to worse. Things get from um, bad to worse. The She Bible includes a surprising typo. S sorry, the, the, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, refers to an infamous typo or typographical error found in a 1611, that is 1611. The King James. Time, the edition of the King James Bible. The typo is found in the book of Ruth 3.15, that is chapter 3, verse 15 which reads, she went into the city. Um, but this verse refers to God. So it is essentially describing God as a woman. Only a small handful of the she Bibles remain. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to get worse. Oh boy. We now have what is called a gender neutral, neutral. edition of the Bible. The Church of England considers ditching God's masculine pronouns. So whereas it was a typo in the 1611 KJV, they are now making no, a deliberate, de mm -hmm. deliberate thing to mm -hmm. refer to God, in, not in masculine terms as we are used to, but in... New to gender. New, right. Right? So... That's what they're doing to the Bible. And then now, there is the gay Bible, the Queen James version of the Bible. And it's based on the King James, but it's edited to resolve interpretive ambiguity and prevent homophobic misrepresentation. The Queen James Bible seeks to resolve the interpretive ambiguity in the scripture 
as it pertains to homosexuality. So they want the Bible to endorse homosexuality, the LGBT agenda, so they have edited it so that it seems okay. So they say there's no perfect Bible translation, but we wanted one that could not be used to spread hate in the name of our faith. We edited those eight verses in a way that makes homophobic interpretations impossible. This is what they are doing to God's word. Brother Goldburn, you are way at the back. You have to come to the microphone so the folk online can hear you. All right. While Brother Goldburn is coming, um, the usage of online Bibles continues to increase. So now the Lord has moved from just the paper and ink, and the Lord is using technology. All right. So we have online Bible. In 24, just, just a moment. In 2014, Bible Gateway had 1.5 billion page views with more than 150 million unique visitors. So Bible Gateway is a site that I visit mm. for this reason. When I'm creating the slides for the PowerPoint, I just go online for the Bible. So rather than sitting down Elder Barry and typing on the slide, I just open Bible Gateway, go to the scripture that I want, copy and paste, and I'm done. That's what Gateway provides. It also provides you to study. So if you want to compare Bible versions, you can do that. If you want to go to the Bible Concordance, it, it leads you to Strong's Concordance, where you can look on the Hebrew or Greek or Aramaic word um, that, you are, that, that is in the scripture that you are dealing with. The root word. All right? Then there are commentaries. So sometimes I go to um, Fawcett and Brown, I go to John Gill, I go to Adam Clark, Matthew Henry, and so on. Um, um, Barnes, I don't remember his first name, Albert Barnes. So you can do the Bible study online. You have the U version Bible app, and it offers more than 1,000 translations of the Bible, and has been downloaded more than 150 million times. The, the Bible the Bible that is up refers to the Bible in full or in part in more than 1,600 languages. And I think, the, uh, was this the one that Elder? No, this is not the one that. Listen to this. The largest Bible factory in the world, listen to this, is a communist, is a communist government sanctioned NGO. That, me that means non-governmental organization. The Amity Bible Printing Company in Nanjing, China. An atheist, Trevor McKendrick, makes over $100,000 a year selling a Spanish Bible app. This man does not believe in God, but he's making money off a Bible app. Yes. But the one that strikes me is what we just read before that communism eliminates the Bible, bans the Bible. And the same company that was producing communist literature during the time of Chairman Mao in China is now the government that was spewing, that was spewing the communist ideology, Marxism, Leninism, has now flipped the coin and used that same agency to produce and distribute the word of God. The Lord said, my word shall not return unto me void. So, the this, this statistics earlier, Elder, that we gave regarding the reading of the Bible is incomplete. It cannot be measured because what they gave us was the, what was printed now, when we go into the use of technology, they can't track it down. It's too immeasurable. Much, it's immeasurable. Brother Goldbone, you can make your point now. Come to the mic and make your point. Come to the microphone. Oh, yes. I would like to just clarify this because from an early stage, I understand the King James did destroy the Bible. So that's why they called King James by um, virgin. Because after the slavery, the um, King James never wanted the people to have the knowledge of the Bible. 
So he destroyed us and he wrote King James Version. I want to clarify it if it's ever true. True you in the No, he sanctioned the he authorized the copying and printing of the Bible in English. That's right. So essentially, Brother Goldburn, what happened was that and this is I'm I'm giving you a thumbnail sketch of one of the presentations that's gonna come later down down the year in the this the quarter. Um, so William Tyndale, you can sit. Okay. William Tyndale was uh, well back up. Um, Wycliffe, John Wycliffe was the first Englishman to translate the Bible into the language of the English people. But he translated it from available sources, which was um, the Latin version. A, um, a, a hundred years later, there came this guy named um, Erasmus. He, based on the collection of Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, Greek texts that came into Europe in 1455, he had the collection of the ancient um, Greek manuscripts and so on. So he was not able to compare. And what he did, he put together a document which is um, like a Greek lexicon or dictionary. And from this collection, from this collection, the, the Bible was translated into German in 50, well, the New Testament in 1521 by Luther. In 1526, thereabout, it was William Tyndale who did that in English. But of course, in, um, he was killed by the enemies of the church. In um, the Council of Trent, which took place 1456 to 1563, the Jesuit put out a Bible in English in 1581 to counter the English Bible of Tyndale. How were the Protestants going to respond? So when Elizabeth I, who succeeded Bloody Mary, came to the throne, she swung England back to Protestantism. Then after she died, James came to power and commissioned the translation into the language of the common people, the Bible into English. That's why it's called the King James Version. And those of us who have an edition of the King James Version, if you notice, when you open the first page, it said, appointed to be read in churches. I don't know if many of you remember that. Appointed to, in other words, it must not be chained to the, the lectern where they would read from. The common people must have the Bible in their hands. And when they go to church, they must hear Bible readings. All right? So he was not against the scriptures coming to people. He was for it. And for that reason, they tried to blow up the British Parliament with him in there. But he fought by Guy Fawkes. Today they have Guy Fawkes there. But they found the culprit and he was, um, he was um, what do they call it now? He was put to death for his crime, he and his cohorts. All right? Very interesting. Uh, we have about three minutes to wrap up, so we'll just go to this part very quickly. I will skip over this part, Elder. We don't need to talk about the number of words in the Bible and so on, mm -hmm. and all of that. We, do, we want to get to the part where we talk about how the Bible is such an important document that it is used in very important um, um, ceremonies. Mm -hmm. Can you name a ceremony in which the Bible is used? When they are? A swearing in ceremony. Mm -hmm. So when the president is being sworn into office, he swears on the Bible. You go to court, in, you are, you, sworn, in you on are the sworn in on the Bible. Why? Because society recognizes that this book is the word of God and therefore mm -hmm. contains the truth. Mm -hmm. So they say you swear to tell the truth, 
the whole truth, nothing but the truth, not a hole in the truth. So help me God. Because this is the truth. So even secular people recognize the importance of the Bible. All right? Um, I'm going to skip over this part about what the Catholics believe because they said the same thing, essentially what we believe about the Bible. However, they have scripture and, and tradition as their authority. Um, but we just want to close by talking about how the Quran, the uh, Muslim holy book, looks on the Bible. Go ahead, Elder. Islam recognizes the divine origins of the earlier Hebrew and Christian scriptures and represents itself as both a restoration and a continuation of their traditions. Because of this, the Quran draws on biblical stories and repeats many biblical themes. In particular, the stories of several biblical prophets appear in the Quran, some in a condensed form. Other stories, such as those of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, are given in elaborate detail and even with subtle revisions of the biblical accounts. One of the, most, one of the important differences between the Quranic and biblical stories of Abraham's sacrifice of his son, for example, is that the, Quran's, the Quran suggests this son is Ishmael, from whom Arabs are descended, and naturally so, because um, the Quran is mainly the Arab, um, Arabian um, world, mm -hmm. world book, Bible. Mm -hmm. And he was descended from the Arab Isaac, the Arab and from, from whom e the tribes of Israel so the, are so, descended. So pause, the Arabs descended from Ishmael, mm -hmm. whereas the Hebrews descended from Isaac. Isaac. So um, the Quran is saying the promised seed is not Isaac, it's Ishmael. Mm -hmm. All right? A more substantial difference relates to the Islamic story of Jesus, who according to the Quran is a mortal human prophet. The Islamic faith categorically rejects the idea that God was ever born, as opposed to Christian belief that Jesus was born the Son of God. Islam also rejects the idea that God shared his divinity with any other being. Another important idea elaborated in the Quran and later Islamic doctrine, in conscious distinction from the biblical accounts, is that although prophets are capable of human errors, God protects them from committing sins and also protects them from excruciating suffering or humiliating experiences. God would not abandon his prophets in times of distress. Therefore, the Quran maintains that God interfered to save Jesus from torture and death by lifting him to heaven and replacing him on the cross with someone who looked like him. So what the Quran is saying is that at the cross, God double-crossed us. You get that? Because the Quran says, the Quran says that God took Jesus away and put a body double on the cross. That's double cross. All right? All right. So, friends, we now begin to understand that the Bible came into the world through the divine agency of the Holy Spirit. It contains the word of God. And there are so many interesting facts and features re regarding the Bible. But we can summarize by saying this book is a miracle. It's a miracle of God. And many have died who have written or translated or defended this book. They have died for doing so. But what the Lord says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. I am going to leave you with this, um, this uh, little tribute from John Clifford. The anvil of God's word. Now the anvil is a tool on which the shoemaker beats oh, the, the metal, sorry, the blacksmith rather, 
beat the metal to shape for the horseshoe. All right? John, Gif John Clifford says, Last eve, I paused beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring, the vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's word. For sages, for ages. I'm sorry, for ages, ages. skeptic ages. blows have beat upon. Yet, though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the, the hammers gone. gone. All who have been attacking the Bible, they are gone. The Bible is still here, mm -hmm. still guiding God's people. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. We thank you for joining us in the study. For those in the, in the congregation who gave your contribution, we see your comments, members in the virtual class, and we thank you all for your comments and your contribution. Thank you to the the technical team, group of young people who provide us with uh, ability to transmit every week. Thank you to the community services, Sister King, Sister um, Sterling, and Sister Hilton, who provide us with nourishment when we have closed. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Next week, we are going to continue our study on the Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that the anvil of your word remains and will remain. Help us to anchor our faith in your word and lead us safely home, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next week.